Now, tonight, Nick Barris talks with the lone survivor about escaping almost certain death. And he speaks to us exclusively about his concerns over the safety of a busy state highway. We're talking about a devastating wreck that started with a tractor trailer losing control on the state highway. Two other vehicles became involved, and it all ended down in this ravine. He has a broke vertebrae. Along with a fractured kneecap, but Jay Scruggs is just thankful he's not part of this headline. A devastating wreck on Highway 52 in Macon County this past weekend killed three others. Somehow Scruggs survived. It was really scary considering I done lost one son on this road. Bonita Scruggs couldn't bear to lose another. Her son Jay said someone was watching over him. I blacked out. Only thing I seen was my brother. He told me, get out, get out. You believe you had a guardian angel? Yes, my brother. Scruggs was driving westbound on 52 in the rain when an eastbound tractor trailer suddenly jackknifed, drifting into his lane. Seconds later, Scruggs witnessed the deaths of the driver and passenger in a pickup just ahead of him when they collided first with the big rig. As soon as I seen the top peel off that truck, I said, oh God, what do I do now? And I, something just told me to whip the wheel. And where well, I didn't go under tires, I hit the back bumper. Scruggs' pickup slid to the shoulder. The big rig ended up in a ravine. The driver died. Three lives gone in an instant. Welcome back. Behind me, you're looking at a beautiful painting, a painting that sells for thousands of dollars. Okay, you say, so what? Well, this is what. This magnificent work of art was painted by a spiritual young lady who was all of 11 years old. She's Akiane Kromerik, and she's been painting from the age of four. To say that this Post Falls, Idaho native is an extraordinary talent would be a gross understatement. Now come with us as we meet this young genius with such an amazing gift and learn how she does it and how she changes the lives of all who have come in contact with her. One day I had a dream of meeting God. But I was not quite sure. I had never met God. I had never been told about God. It was very confusing because at that time I was an atheist. But her talk was intelligent. Every time she would talk about God and the details of her life in heaven, how she described it, it was, an, it was very, very sophisticated. And I knew that at that time nobody else could have influenced her in that way because we led a closed life. As time went on, uh, we paid more attention to it and then she, uh, uh, it developed into painting and then poetry. The angel has like faith and hope still and they have power from God. They're angels, they're guardians for us. I wanted to show how the angels protect us, how angels just show us where to lead show us where to go and even difficult paths. When I started doing all these details, it's like, well, how did that happen? How did God give me the, these ideas? And he gives me those ideas through my visions and dreams at night or when I'm walking, when I'm reading, or anything I do. So when I started having those, I said, I need to do something. I have a, a mission to complete in life. I wanted to express the beauty and the suffering of the black race. When I was painting her eyes, you could see her whole, whole life in her eyes. You could see how, she, how much she provided in her family and how she believed in God with hope. And I painted Jesus when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's raising the world to his Father and saying, forgive them. And I, I wanted to paint him because he's, he's everything that I am. He's everything that I want, I want to be and everything that I will be. She would talk about the future events that God shared with her and I would write everything down in a diary. A lot of times, most of the times, and I would say 95% of the time, she said, I was taken, I was shown, but you're forbidden to know. When a time will come, you will know. And there was nothing I could do to extract the information, which was very frustrating for me. You know, I look around and uh, 
I, I, I'm amazed because I know how much work's involved. I know how much she works. I'm with her all the time where she works. And I, I, I get goosebumps a lot of times and say, no. What are we doing today? You know, <laughs> you know, what's going on today? So it's, yeah, I, I'm uh, excited, uh, flabbergasted, and just amazed a lot of times. I saw this in, in in my dream. I saw that, and I felt that it was in real life. That see-through world, and I saw that. I saw many other things, many other planets, and this is the most this is the most beautiful spot I ever saw. And this I wanted to put him instead of me in the background into this picture. When I'm frustrated, I need to like pray for a little bit and says I need, I need to go back on track. I need God's help to help me to fix this mistake. Then he tells me and then I start doing it and I feel okay again. He gave me this scroll of poems and I read it. Now, and I can I remember it even this day and those and what I remember it's in my poetry and and when I write, I write effortlessly. I write without thinking. You need to cleanse and silent your eyes, for dizzy prayer bounces off a wall. All of your smile lands on silent swan. You need your love to catch you when you fall. Brassy visions count each and every stone. There are so many lives in this lonely womb. When feelings are hungry, mirrors show different faces. The only evening the swan lands, she looks for you. Some people need church to, to know where they're going. And for us, we, we like to like go wherever we can in quiet and pray for all of it. I keep doing that each day even, and, and I like it. And everywhere we go, even when I'm driving, or I'm on television or in interviews, I start praying. I say, please, give me these words to tell other people what you have done to me, what, have, what have I have experienced. And I, and I said, thank you, and then he helps me. And it's very, it's very good, and very good feeling. And welcome back. You know, we were just talking about this portrait of Jesus before the break. It's called Prince of Peace and featured in the book Heaven is for Real. You may be surprised to learn the age of the artist and her heavenly inspiration. For art prodigy Akiana Kramaric, heaven has always been in the details. Her paintings, complex, vibrant, and inspired by an astonishing spiritual connection. At just four years old, Akiana began to have visions of being in heaven and meeting God. She began translating those visions onto paper. Most extraordinary, the concept of God hadn't even been introduced to Akiana as a child. Her parents were self-described atheists. At six, she turned to painting, bringing her heavenly visions to life through her art. I get up at 4.30 every morning and I do art at 5, then I do probably 2 to 3 hours. Homeschooled and self-taught, she continues to paint six days a week and today has produced more than 200 paintings, all influenced by the same faith and heavenly inspiration that she has carried from childhood. When I paint, um, for example, the planted eyes, and some people say it's not religious, but I know inside it, it is everything I do that has a meaning of spirituality. Now, Akiana was just 10 years old in that video. She's now 18, and some of her paintings are worth more than a million dollars. Akiana, thank you so much thank for being you. here. Thank you. It's an honor. So you were just four years old when you believe you started hearing voices from heaven. Yes, and it just I just came in a fa through a family that was not religious at all. Um, but when I started having, receiving these visions at four, it was just way too complex to describe them through words. And I just, the only thing I could use was colors. You started painting yeah, and absolutely. drawing. Yep. And this is the Prince of Peace, which I mentioned earlier. Yes. And, and you were only, I cannot believe this, eight years old when you painted this? I was, I was. But the image came to me ever since I was three and a half, four years old. But it was like a blurry, like an image. 
But it was only when I was eight years old when this, this carpenter came knocking on our door when I said, this is the perfect time to paint the story of love, unity, and peace. A carpenter, of course. <laughs> <Go figure. laughs> when I heard that, I was like, wow, okay, and actually, that makes sense. And actually, um, we did some researchers um, actually analyzed my work, and they compared the Shroud of Turin with my work this particular painting and they said it was almost 80 to 90 percent accuracy. But tell me about this next painting. You were how old when you painted this? This is when I was 10. Um, it's called Creation and this actually happened by accident. It was a time where I just let myself go and I just somehow this place came about and I just remembered that this was the place I used to to visit as a child. And your, your dad's in the audience, your dad, Mark. And hi, Mark. What, what did you think? As, as Akiana said, you guys were not a religious family at all. When, when she started talking about this and painting these things, what was your reaction? Uh, at first, I didn't understand how, how, where this came from. We weren't, you know, I was an agnostic. My wife's an atheist, and we didn't speak it in the house. But uh, to this day, I still, still can't figure it out. <laughs> but it's, it's, I, I was just shocked. Have you changed? Are you now more religious as a result of Akiana's work? Yeah, I'm more, I'm more, yeah, yeah. Let's there go, is life after death. Yeah. Let's go to, <laughs> sorry? There is life after death. Well, that's what a lot of people I know think and, and, and are wondering a lot more, I think, after watching this show. Tell me about this final painting. This is actually called I Am, and it was one of the most hardest paintings that I've ever done. I think it's because based on the story, the question of who are we, why are we here, and and, and and what? what? So what's this place about? This took six and a half months six and to and half, paint. Six and a half months. And it's, I think it's because I just wanted to capture that moment of self-realization of who we are and why are we here. And that's when I wanted to capture this painting because I know that everybody's so, I, in my opinion, everybody's perfect. Everybody is irreplaceable and unique. And I want people to to get inspired by looking at this painting. I know you have fewer visions now. Does that worry you? It does a little bit, but I know that it will come naturally as I get older because um, when I was younger, uh, this voice told me just, just be prepared not to, to receive anymore. I know it's going to come um, sooner or later. Well, your paintings are extraordinary. Most of us know pilgrims held the first Thanksgiving to celebrate surviving their first harsh winter. Another part of history, though, is fairly unknown. As Paul Strand reports from Plymouth, Massachusetts, an even more impressive miracle saved the pilgrims and nearby Indian tribes just two years later. Plymouth, Massachusetts pulls out all the stops for Thanksgiving, a parade filled with historical reenactors, lots of bands, lots of floats, lots of cheer and fun. But it was a much more somber tone on the very first holiday. As Pilgrim reenactor Leo Martin reminds us, that's because pilgrims in 1621 had survived a first tragic winter that killed 51 of their 102 people. And then their first crop after had thrived. And they thought that they ought to thank God for that. Uh, so they had a Thanksgiving. Martin and his wife run the faith-based Jenny Museum to keep the memory of our pilgrim forefathers' faith alive. He related how the friendly chief Massasoit brought 99 braves to the first Thanksgiving which turned into a three-day celebration. They played games, they shot off guns, they had competitions, and really bonded, which is very important, because you have to understand that uh, because hunters came here before the pilgrims and captured Indians as slaves, there was a little bit of uh, animosity there. Then 1623 brought a drought that threatened to wipe out all the crops of Plymouth Plantation and nearby Indian tribes. Everything wilted. On a Wednesday morning, Governor Bradford turned to his people and he said, we need to get on our knees and ask, have to ask God what we've done wrong. The settlers realized their colony, even their lives, were on the line. And they began to pray. 90 degrees, not a cloud in the sky. Nine in the morning, they started. Noontime, nothing. Two in the afternoon, four o'clock, a little cloud right above the plantation. And by six o'clock, it began to rain. The miracle had begun over the plantation, but now God had to grant a special kind of rain. And I do not mean the kind of rain we're used to in Plymouth, the Nor'easter, where everything gets knocked down, but a soft, gentle rain fell on Plymouth Plantation for two weeks, and the crops were saved. Not only that, as nearby Indian chief Habamak watched, this miracle, this saving rain, initiated a huge leap forward in relations with the pilgrims. 
And when he saw that happen, he went up to William Bradford and he said, Billy, I like your God. He saved your crops. And Habermark became a Christian. And that's when Habermark built his village right across the river from the Pilgrims, three years after the Pilgrims arrived, so he could be closer to his Christian friends and his Christian God. Some criticize the Pilgrims for not being as lively or actively witnessing as today's evangelicals. But Martin has great respect for these early settlers' Christianity. People say to me, the Pilgrims didn't evangelize. You know what they did? They lived their faith. And when you live your faith, it makes an effect. Well, according to some polls, three quarters of Americans do. But if you're among the skeptics, you might want to change your mind when you see this next story. Here's NBC's Ron Mott. Can you kiss me? Colleen Banton didn't expect her disabled daughter, Chelsea, to see her 15th birthday. But she's now the gift of the season for this family. You're seven. Can you count them? A family counting its every blessing. We've been praying for a miracle. And... Um, I think this is the beginning of it. Back in September, pneumonia had pushed Chelsea toward death's door in a Charlotte hospital. Here she is with big sister Kaylee, who thought she was saying her final goodbyes. Yet an hour after life support was removed, jaws began to drop among some hospital workers over what appeared at another door near the teenager's room. And this image appeared up on the security monitor. And um, it was an image of an angel. And um, I thought, well, either that's the angel coming to uh, take her to heaven or it's an angel to say that she's getting better. And she got better all right almost immediately, Mom says. And the doctors and the nurses were all amazed. The mother took this cell phone picture of the image, bright bands of light only visible on the hospital security monitor. The hospital confirms that some of its workers told the family they saw something as well. It's a blessing. Oh. It's a miracle, and um, I'm learning not to take things for granted. It's an emotional story to tell, and just off camera, Chelsea herself begins to cry at the sight of her mom breaking up. Please don't cry. <sighs> it's okay. It's okay. And because you know she's better. okay for now, the focus is on celebrations. Her you know 15th birthday okay. is right around the corner. <laughs> This will be a special birthday. Mm. Who knows, it could be her last, but um, she's come this far. Mm. And uh, mm. I'm not giving up now. A birthday that comes every Christmas, but this year it's touched by an angel. Here's a question. Do you believe in heaven? Various polls find that somewhere around 80% of Americans do. But a Harvard-trained brain surgeon wasn't so sure until he spent a week in a coma and came out with an incredible description of the afterlife. My co-anchor Terry Moran has a story. A mild afternoon in Lynchburg, Virginia, and Eben and Holly Alexander are at a high school soccer game cheering on their 14-year-old son, Bond. They are a perfectly ordinary American family with an extraordinary story. They have been touched by a medical miracle and maybe more. I mean, it was impossible after impossible after impossible. Eben Alexander, a Harvard-trained neurosurgeon who was a skeptic when it came to religion, survived a near-death experience, and he now carries the memory of what he says was a journey to heaven, a journey that all his scientific training cannot explain. On November 10th, 2008, Eben awoke with a searing headache. When his wife Holly checked in on him, he was having a tremendous seizure. And I said, say something. And he didn't say anything, so I called 911. Eben was rushed to the hospital where he worked as a neurosurgeon. The only word we could truly make out was help. And the rest of his verbalization was purely uh, screaming. 
Eben Alexander had been stricken with an extremely rare and virulent E. coli meningitis infection that was ravaging his brain, plunging him into a coma. I mean, I was trying to die. In fact, doctors gave him almost no chance to live and told his family if he did survive, he'd be brain damaged for the rest of his life. His eyes were just off and cocked. <laughs> it was just like no one was there. Eben believes Holly is right. He wasn't there. Did you go to heaven? Yes. I mean, in, in every sense of the word, that's what my, what my experience showed me. His first recollection, he says, was being a speck of pure awareness in a dark and murky underworld. And then I was rescued by this beautiful spinning white light that had a, a melody, indescribably beautiful melody with it, that opened up into a bright valley. Just an incredible, rich, ultra-real world uh, of indescribable complexity. God was there, he says, and he encountered him through an orb of brilliant light. He soared on the wing of a butterfly with a beautiful young woman as his companion, and the young woman gave him a message to take back from heaven. You are loved, you are cherished, there's nothing you have to fear, there's nothing you can do wrong. It's a beautiful vision, but heaven? A lot of people are going to say, Doctor, it was a hallucination. Your brain got zapped by this disease. All the wires got crossed. And you saw a girl on a butterfly wing, and you were spinning up in a melody. I know this was not a hallucination, not a dream, not what we call a confabulation. I know that it really occurred and I know it occurred outside of my brain. So basically... Uh, the whole but how? How can he even suggest that, much less claim that his experience is proof of heaven, as he's called his new book? He showed us his brain scan. It wasn't leaving any part of my uh, cortex unaffected. So your conclusion is because all of this outer area, which is the higher functioning, was covered with the infection, what you experienced in the coma wasn't part of the brain. Right. Many neuroscientists are deeply skeptical of Eben's claims, arguing his brain must have produced his vision somehow, most likely as he came out of coma. But something else happened. After he recovered, Eben, who was adopted, saw a picture of a sister from his biological family who died years ago, a woman he never knew. And I knew who my guardian angel was on the butterfly wing. It was the most profound experience I've ever had in this life. Your sister, by birth, and from a family that you didn't know because you were adopted, who died several years ago, who you had never met, you saw while you were in coma. Yes. And that was the key. That explained Everything. Oh, good. That's for sure. Dinner time at the Alexander home. Come, Lord Jesus, our guest to be. They were not a particularly religious family before Eben's coma. He was a skeptic. Not anymore. This proves that our our soul, our consciousness, our uh, spirit doesn't depend on the existence of the brain and body at all and easily is actually freed up to a much higher state of knowing when it's freed from this body. Is it otherworldly or a synapse in the brain? Trapped in a car or caught up in a terror attack, it's those moments while fighting for survival that some people report an overwhelming sense of calm piercing through the panic. It's repeatedly described as spiritual, even divine. Could it be the work of guardian angels? Okay? I can't hear. In a moment of mayhem, or in that instant of exquisite fear. And I looked at my air gauge and I thought, okay, this is it. Human beings often report being comforted by an invisible companion. You know, only my guardian angel could have saved me from such an accident as that. Rose Benvenuto says she glimpsed hers at the scene of a terrible car wreck. Nick Sedoya never felt alone, though lost for days in a California canyon. Did you at any point give up hope? No, never. Um, I had my, my buddy who died last year. Uh, by my side, I felt his presence. 
And the last words Felix Baumgartner heard before stepping from the brink of space en route to setting the world's skydiving record were these. Okay, here we go. And our guardian angel will take care of you. Again and again and again, as my guardian angel was here, who is the guardian angel? Well, that's the great mystery, isn't it? John Geiger, an internationally known explorer and author, has been investigating this phenomenon for years. His book, The Third Man Factor, lays out his theory. The stories are always similar, that there's a, a, a sense of a, another being, a presence, very vividly. There's never any fear or panic when this being appears. There's just a sense of calm, peace. It happened to Stephanie Schwab. I'm about as religious as a piece of wood. While cave diving for a research project in the Bahamas, she suddenly lost her guide rope. In an instant, her life was on the line. I suddenly realized that I was in trouble. I knew my heart rate, I could hear it bouncing in my ears. And I just kind of sat there on the floor and I started crying. <laughs> I never cried underwater before. Only weeks before, Stephanie's husband and diving partner, Rob Palmer, had died in a diving accident in the Red Sea. And now, alone, she's facing her own dark death. Suddenly the whole cave just brightened up. And into that world floated the words of Stephanie's husband. Believe you can, believe you can't. Either way, you're right. And then I, I calmed down and then I suddenly looked around and I saw what I thought was a thread, a white thread, which is my guideline is white. So I floated up and lo and behold, it was my line. He was there for me in a way, you know, in, a, in an emotional way. Sometimes the communication isn't with sound, but with images. A few weeks ago, Marty Hodges took his two teenage boys skiing in Colorado. The wide open spaces, perfect for a man with an extreme case of claustrophobia. But then, an avalanche. And I saw it just coming towards me. It's really fast, and I couldn't do anything. Then I finally, like, my goggles ripped off. Then I had uh, snow coming down my throat. I couldn't breathe for like 15 seconds. For me, you know, when I was hit by the snow and I immediately was turned inside out in this complete blackness, I was sure I was going to die. But instead of being paralyzed by his claustrophobia, Marty's mind delivered an even more chilling vision and a reason to fight his way free. I could see myself literally at Denver International Airport out on the tarmac, mm -hmm. watching him go in an old-fashioned pine box being slid into the back of a 757, you know what I mean? And I can see it very clear. Where did that image come from? I have no idea. Driven by that haunting image, Marty instantly made his decision. Battling through the snow, he was able to search for and then reunite with his sons. And just last week in Boston, Steve Byrne, standing at the finish line when the first bomb exploded, made a split-second decision to turn away from where the next bomb would wreak its havoc. I know that one second different and six inches to the right, and it would have been a whole different outcome for myself. The guardian angel was definitely over my shoulder that day. We turn now to a story that some say is a true miracle. A woman trapped in the wreckage of a car crash as rescue workers try in vain to free her like an answer to a prayer Help arrives just in time, but that is the beginning of the mystery. ABC's John Muller has the story. This morning, a small Missouri town is looking for the man in this sketch. He's not suspected of a crime, but a miracle. I think that this time I've actually witnessed a guardian angel at work. Sunday morning, a drunk driver hit Katie Lenz head on, pinning the 19 year old in the front seat of her convertible. Her vital signs failing fast, she asked rescue crews to pray with her. That's when first responders say a man who looked like a Catholic priest seemed to appear out of nowhere, despite a two-mile perimeter blocking the scene. He began to pray and use the anointing oil. There was a calmness that, come, that to me seemed to come over the entire scene. Another seemingly divine detail, firefighters say their equipment kept failing until that mystery man showed up. The words were to remain calm, that our tools would now work. Instantaneously at that moment, our neighboring department arrived with fresh extrication tools. Lens was saved, but when Cruz turned around to thank the man, he'd vanished. 
This morning, Lenz is recovering in the hospital with broken legs and ribs. But some say it could have been worse, if not for that seemingly heavenly hero on the highway. Whether it was just a, a, a priest as an angel, serving as an angel, or an actual angel that came in, he was an angel to, to all those Whipped the wheel, and where well, I didn't go on their tires, I hit the back bumper. Scruggs' pickup slid to the shoulder. The big rig ended up in a ravine. The driver died. Three lives gone in an instant. Welcome back. Behind me, you're looking at a beautiful painting, a painting that sells for thousands of dollars. Okay, you say, so what? Well, this is what. This magnificent work of art was painted by a spiritual young lady who was all of 11 years old. She's Akiane Kromerik, and she's been painting from the age of four. To say that this Post Falls, Idaho native is an extraordinary talent would be a gross understatement. Now come with us as we meet this young genius with such an amazing gift and learn how she does it and how she changes the lives of all who have come in contact with her. One day I had a dream of meeting God, but I was not quite sure. I had never met God and never been told about God. It was very confusing because at that time I was an atheist. But her talk was intelligent. Every time she would talk about God in the details of her life in heaven, how she described it. Yeah, tonight, Nick Barris talks with the lone survivor about escaping almost certain death. And he speaks to us exclusively about his concerns over the safety of a busy state highway. We're talking about a devastating wreck that started with a tractor trailer losing control on the state highway. Two other vehicles became involved, and it all ended down in this ravine. He has a broke vertebrae. Along with a fractured kneecap, but Jay Scruggs is just thankful He's not part of this headline. A devastating wreck on Highway 52 in Macon County this past weekend killed three others. Somehow Scruggs survived. It was really scary considering I done lost one son on this road. Bonita Scruggs couldn't bear to lose another. Her son Jay said someone was watching over him. I blacked out. The only thing I'd seen was my brother. He told me, get out, get out. You believe you had a guardian angel? Yes, my brother. Scruggs was driving westbound on 52 in the rain when an eastbound tractor trailer suddenly jackknifed, drifting into his lane. Seconds later, Scruggs witnessed the deaths of the driver and passenger in a pickup just ahead of him when they collided first with the big rig. As soon as I seen the top peel off that truck, I said, oh God, what do I do now? And I, something just told me to work. He's, he's everything that I am. He's everything that I want. I want to be and everything that I will be. She would talk about the future events that God shared with her. And I would write everything down in a diary. A lot of times, most of the times, and I would say 95% of the time, she said, I was taken, I was shown, but you're forbidden to know. When a time will come, you will know. And there was nothing I could do to extract the information, which was very frustrating for me. You know, I look around and uh, I, I'm amazed because I know how much work's involved. I know how much she works. I'm with her all the time where she works. And I, I, I get goosebumps a lot of times and say, no, what are we doing today? You know, <laughs> you know, what's going on today? So it's, 
Yeah, I'm uh, excited, uh, flabbergasted, and just amazed a lot of times. I saw this in, in, in my dream. I saw that, and I felt that it was in real life. That see-through world, and I saw that. I saw many other things, many other planets. And this is the, mo this is the most beautiful spot I ever saw. And this I wanted to put him instead of me in the background into this picture. When I'm frustrated, I need to like pray for a little bit and says I need, I need to go back on track. I need God's help. It was an, it was very very sophisticated, and I knew that at that time nobody else could have influenced her in that way because we led a closed life. As time went on, uh, we paid more attention to it, and then she. Uh, uh, it developed into painting and then poetry. The angel has like faith and hope still and they have power from God. They're angels, they're guardians for us. I wanted to show how the angels protect us, how, how angels just show us where to lead, show us where to go and even difficult paths. When I started doing all these details, it's like, well, how did that happen? How did God give me the, these ideas? And he gives me those ideas through my visions and dreams at night or when I'm walking, when I'm reading, or anything I do. So when I started having those, I said, I need to do something. I have a, a mission to complete in life. I wanted to express the beauty and the suffering of the black race. When I was painting her eyes, you could see her whole, whole life in her eyes. You could see how, she, how much she provided in her family and how she believed in God with hope. And I painted Jesus when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's raising the world to his Father and saying, forgive them. And I, I wanted to paint him because he to help me to fix this mistake. Then he tells me and then I start doing it and I feel okay again. He gave me this scroll of poems and I read it. Uh, and I can I remember it even this day, and those and what I remember it's in my poetry, and and when I write I write effortlessly I write without thinking. You need to cleanse and silence your eyes, for dizzy prayer bounces off a wall. All of your smile lands on silent swan. You need your love to catch you when you fall. Brassy visions count each and every stone. There are so many lives in this lonely womb. When feelings are hungry, mirrors show different faces. The only evening the swan lands, she looks for you. Some people need church to, to know where they're going. And for us, we, we like to like go wherever we can in quiet and pray for all of it. I keep doing that each day even, and, and I like it. And everywhere we go, even when I'm driving or I'm on television or in interviews, I start praying. I say, please, give me these words.